This is it, guys. The final chapter. It's over after this one. Yep. Jason better have turned in all of his videotapes, because he ain't going to be taking them back after this one's over. Mm-hmm. No more Friday the 13th after this one. Nope. No way. Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights, a part of the Kings of Horror Network. I'm M.L. Miller. While you might be watching this video on the Kings of Horror Network, I urge you to click over to my M.L. Miller Frights page and give it a like, share with your buddies across the electronic superhighway, click subscribe to this channel, and don't forget to ring that bell for notifications. Friday the 13th Part 4, the final chapter, was released in 1984. It was directed by Joseph Zito and written by Barney Cohen from a story by Bruce Hidemi Sakao. Every Friday for the next few weeks, I'm going to be taking on the arduous task of looking at all of the Friday the 13th films to celebrate the Shout Factory's monumental release of the Friday the 13th Collection Deluxe Edition box set. This one is up there towards the top of my own list of the best of the Friday the 13ths, but some regard Friday the 13th Part 4, the final chapter, as the best of the series. There's a lot to like in Missing in Action, The Prowler, Red Scorpion, Invasion USA director Joseph Zito's installment, which at the time was supposed to put the final nail in the Jason Voorhees coffin for good. And while the final chapter part is somewhat of a laughable subtitle, given that many, many films were made after it, it thematically brought everything full circle to the beginning, and serves as a deeper film than most would give it credit. Zito did a fantastic job with a couple of things in this installment. First and foremost, he got a likable and relatable cast together. Without a doubt, this is the most talented bunch of actors ever to be in one Friday the 13th film. Sure, the original had Kevin Bacon, but this one has 8th Wonder of the World Crispin Glover, Corey Feldman circa Goonies, The Power of Matthew Starr's Peter Barton, Last American Virgin's Lawrence Monison. And last, but certainly not least, Weird Science gorgeous Judy Aronson. Hello, baby. I am the luxmith of love, no? Now I'm not saying these are Oscar winners, but as far as people who are recognizable, had a career beyond Crystal Lake, and most importantly, relatable, this is a great cast. While his career might not be what it was, Corey Feldman can proudly add this performance as Tommy Jarvis as one of his most iconic as the boy who finally was able to do what no camper has done before, kill Jason. Feldman does a great job of showing the charm that made him so memorable and fun in Goonies and Stand By Me, especially amongst the rest of the older cast. Feldman's Tommy is not unlike Jason himself. Thematically, Friday the 13th Part 4 is one of the strongest of all of the Friday the 13th films. Zito peppers it in, but those panning the series as fluff simply aren't looking hard enough. The final chapter, in many ways, is a retelling of Jason's origin with different people, with Tommy playing the outcast kid among adults who can't take care of him, and Tommy's mother, Joan Freeman, giving subtle nods to Miss Voorhees throughout. Tommy's the child of a protective single mother, just like Jason. Check out the number of times the camera lingers on the face of Mrs. Jarvis, who definitely disapproves of the partying kids who have moved in next door. She closes the blind in Tommy's room when she sees the view of the couple making out, through the window, and seems extremely protective of her little boy every time the kids are around. Sure, Mrs. Jarvis is not going to slap on a thick sweater and start murdering counselors, but her reactions definitely reflect the same feelings Pamela Voorhees must have had with her little boy. In this sense, Zito and writer Barney Cohen seem to be putting in themes that later directors were just too lazy to do, and giving the story a bit more beef than most. While Friday the 13th is about the creative kills, I love these subtle little themes that make the first four of the series stand out as the richest of the bunch. Corey Feldman also reflected us, the viewer, fascinated with horror and horror effects. Remember, this came out during the age of Fangoria, where the special effects guys were the rock stars of the genre. Seeing his room filled with masks, genre toys, and horror props was like looking into my own childhood room. Side note. I still have a hockey mask and crossed machetes hanging on my wall of my childhood room back in Ohio, much to my mother's dismay. 
While the film was definitely rated R, the filmmakers were self-aware enough to know that kids were watching and loving the Friday the 13th series. Putting a kid in the role of Jason Killer was a no-brainer, and it works to pull the viewer in to understand and empathize with Jason through Tommy. Kimberly Beck's Trish character was one of the spunkier final girls of the series. While she obviously has the hots for Jason Hunter Rob, played by Eric Anderson, she embodies everything the final girl needs. That is, a strong set of morals of right and wrong, the ability to say no to temptation, and the ability to unleash a holy vengeance upon Jason when cornered. The scene where Jason is on top of her and she's busting out with a flurry of fists and kicks is truly badass. Plus, name another gal who would rather take a nosedive out of a second-story window and stick that landing so perfectly. Like her mother and Pamela Voorhees, Trish embodies that protective mother figure as well when it comes to Tommy, though she does it within the final girl role. While the role has since become somewhat of a standby in horror films, Crispin Glover is amazingly weird as the outsider of the group. He's no prankster like Shelley or Ned, but he definitely is the clown that no one really takes seriously. His line delivery, that freaking dance number, the fact that he's the only guy who actually gets laid in the film. Everything he does is so bonkers that you really do miss him when he's inevitably killed by Jason. While Kevin Bacon was great in part one, I don't think he offered up a performance that would make him a star. Glover does that in this film, as he's hilarious every time he's on screen. And let's chat about that dance. According to director Zito, Glover would dance like that in L.A. clubs, and they had trouble keeping the cast from laughing while filming it. It's truly one of the weirder, yet more fascinating non-Jason moments in the series. And while it might have been odd to incorporate, I would have loved to have seen Glover repeat those herky-jerky moves when he's killed later. My favorite cast member, though, is Judy Aronson. My little darling, it is love at first sight, is it not? No? Mm -hmm. Watching these early Friday the 13th films have really brought me back to the memories of my discovery of women in cinema in my youth, along with Night of the Comets Kelly Maroney, Amityville The Possessions Diane Franklin, and Halloween 3's Season of the Witch as Stacey Nelkin, Aronson rounds out my most gorgeous women of the 80s horror picks. While Aronson's part is small as the promiscuous and jealous Sam, her skinny dipping scene is one for the ages. The fact that behind the scenes she was almost suffering from hypothermia out there in the cold after multiple takes and retakes ordered by Zito makes her all the more of a trooper for going full Monty in this film. Aronson's three nude scenes are pretty epic, even for the sex-heavy series, but she definitely delivers more than skin to the game. There's something about her sing-song voice as she says, Screw you, Polly, that gets me every time. Speaking of nudity, while Friday the 13th is notorious for its nudity, it really wasn't until this film that it became a staple in the franchise. Sure, there was skinny dipping Terry in part two, but nudity was at a minimum up until this fourth installment, where the aforementioned Aronson strips three times for the camera, and twins, Camilla and Carrie Moore, go for broke in the skinny dipping scene as well. But while later installments have nudity just for nudity's sake, at least Zito's seems to be making a point with the multiple boob shots to distinguish the virtuous from the not, a theme that grows to epic proportions in this installment. The interconnectability also makes this installment all the more enjoyable for those who had been following the series up to this point. Technically, the story takes place between Sunday the 15th and Monday the 16th, since Part 3, Saturday the 14th, occurs immediately after Part 2, which happens on Jason's birthday. The fact that one could sit down and see a story unfolding is a concept filmmakers forgot about as they began to have each stand on their own in the latter installments. In many ways, that method of storytelling took away from what could have been a more compelling ongoing saga of our hockey masked monster. The way the first four fit together, not seamlessly, but at least they tried, was something that made me a Friday the 13th fan for life. The final chapter does have some of the most brutal kills of the series since the original, not surprisingly, all supervised by FX guru Tom Savini, who returned to the film in order to kill Jason once and for all. Jason's deformed makeup is truly an iconic extension of the earlier Savini makeup of Jason from the original, and the damage Jason endures, such as the machete through the hand and to the head, are wounds that resonate off the screen, causing toes to curl and faces to wince. Even the way Jason crucifies Glover's, Jimmy, is iconic, 
and almost making a statement about the character offering him up as some kind of weird sacrifice for being a virtuous character gone bad. While a lot of them are off-camera kills, the ones that do occur on screen are truly macabre and hard-hitting. The harpoon to the crotch for Paul, the face crush of Doug, Jimmy's multiple wounds from multiple weapons, all savage. The extended scenes included in this Shout Factory presentation are even bloodier, but really only offer more of the red stuff and extended looks at Savini's applications. Even the final moments of the film, that center on the traumatized eyes of Tommy Jarvis as he hugs his sister Trish in the hospital, are not only iconic, but is indicative of what is to come as the next film features Tommy in the institution. It also hints at some of the worst ideas of the entire series, namely that Jason's wrath is contagious and passed on from one person to the next with Tommy now infected with it. While the filmmakers behind The Final Friday completely dropped the ball by taking it way too literally, the seeds were already planted for this development to occur. I don't hate the concept of the death curse passing from one person to the next. Technically, that's what happened to Pamela, to Jason, and then on to Tommy by this point of the series. I just wish later installments would have kept it subtle instead of shoving it in our faces. The final chapter is not innocent of studio intervention and pandering to the masses. Not only does it feature the hugely popular at the time and highly sexualized aerobicize, which I saw at all hours of the day on Showtime as a kid, but Zito himself says that the studios tossed in the twins, Camilla and Carrie Moore, simply because the double mint twins were popular on TV. Sure, there are leaps of logic. This isn't a perfect movie. There's no reason for Rob to go back downstairs after Trish told him someone's in the house. What the hell happened to Gordon the dog? Short of teleporting, another power that I hate that pops up later in the series. There's no rhyme or reason Jason could be in all of those places at once, to kill in that order. And while director Zito says that the story of a man screaming, he's killing me, was the scariest thing he had ever heard, the terror just doesn't translate in this goofy and horribly lit scene. If you want to pick this movie apart, it's not hard to do it. Still, it's a strong entry that actually had a decent budget. The opening sequence, alone with the helicopter, ambulances, and police cars, show that pretty well. This presentation offers up the usual trailers, stills, and radio spots. Zito narrates the aforementioned slash scenes of gore. There's another installment of Lost Tales from Camp Blood, the first part of the Crystal Lake Massacres Revisited, directed by Daniel Farrens, that attempts to tie the movie history and fan theories together. Speaking of fan theories, they seem to try to set up Rob as a red herring with him wearing the same kind of pants and boots as Jason and asking Trish if they were alone in the woods and if there were any campers in the area which is odd since we saw Jason reawaken in the morgue and kill the mortician and the nurse earlier in the film. Rob's function is mysterious at first, and it would have been interesting to see him evolve into a dual threat, maybe a superfan of Jason's. Instead, Rob is made more of a Creighton Duke character from The Final Friday, hunting for Jason and attempting to get retribution for the death of his sister, Sandra, played by Marta Kober in Part 2. How's that for continuity? It's interesting to note that Tommy idolizes Rob when he first meets him, inviting him up to his room and introducing him to all of his masks, just as any fatherless kid acts when a new guy is around. Later, Tommy basically becomes just like Rob in Part 6, obsessed with taking out Jason and willing to take the law into his own hands to do it. Ted White has garnered a lot of fans through the years, mainly because he has been such a nice guy at horror cons. I liked his portrayal as Jason as a much more savage and physical killer. This Jason has the size, moves pretty quick, and is quite savage when it comes to how he doles out his vengeance. White played Jason more like a sleek, speedy, and powerful predator rather than a lumbering brute. While much of this Jason comes from the extensive effects and prosthetic masks provided by Tom Savini, White's contribution to the character made him deadly in every scene. Also included in this set is the unused dream sequence ending for the final chapter. I kind of wish it would have been used or somehow incorporated into some kind of director's cut of the film, as I think it fills in some plot holes regarding what exactly happened to Tommy and Trish's mom, and pays homage to the various dream endings of the past entries of the series. It's a morbid scene, but well paced, and makes the numerous times Trish and Tommy went up and down the stairs, with their mom dead in the tub, all the creepier. If I were to recommend a Friday the 13th film to somebody and not be embarrassed about it, it would be Friday the 13th Part 4, the final chapter. It does almost everything right, 
and really sums up what is cool about this character and this series. It's not classical cinema, but it possesses all of the best qualities that justify the love for those like me who unabashedly adore the series. Friday the 13th Part 4, the final chapters, even got one of the coolest recaps ever at the beginning, using clips from previous films. It's a chapter that seems to be taken seriously by all of those behind it, which is something that can't really be said for later offerings. That'll be it for today. Please chime in in the comments and let me know what you think of this video, how on the nose or mind-numbingly wrong I am, or you can counter with your own review. If you like this video, please pound that thumbs up button. Share this video with your social media addicted pals. If you're looking for written reviews, you can find them on mlmillerwrites.com. Don't forget, I have two new horror comic book trade paperbacks you should look for. Grave Trancers is out right now, and Pirouette, collecting never-before-published issues, will be out in November in only the finest of comic book stores. And be sure to subscribe to this channel, and ring that bell for alerts to be the first to see my future videos. Thank you so much for your time, and take care. You're doomed to live the life you're meant to be Stuck inside your reality